Hello, my name is Rishi. Thank you for joining this presentation of our paper, User HRTF Selection for 3D Auditory Mixed Reality. So I'm going to start with some background, including a definition of this term, auditory mixed reality. So it was a term that was first coined and defined by McGill and colleagues at last year's Kai conference. And just to say that they were referring to current consumer technologies, some of which are displayed on this slide on the right hand side as an example. So it's well established that in order to create convincing binaural rendering, it's important to personalise the filters that create the perceptual effect of 3D sound over headphones. Those filters are known as head-related transfer functions, which we'll refer to from now on as HRTFs. In recent years, there's been a lot of successful research around parametric ways of analysing individual morphology to either select or simulate appropriate HRTFs. But in this context, in an auditory mixed reality context where users are going to be probably just equipped with a smartphone, there are certain challenges to, to that approach. User selection is a viable alternative, but even then there's some considerations that we're going to talk through next. In previous research, we outlined four criteria which we felt were important for any end-user HRTF selection system. They're detailed in full in the paper. But that was in relation to HRTF selection for 2D rendering. And there are a number of problems that present for 3D rendering in auditory mixed reality contexts. Firstly, how do you ensure that the user is exploring fully a range of uh, 3D positions and trajectories? Secondly, in uh, auditory mixed reality contexts, it's not going to be possible to use meaningfully synchronized graphics or any kind of complex input interfacing. And finally, given these complexities, it's going to be really important to demonstrate that any system returns repeatable outcomes over time. This is the methodology that we came up with. So the binaural rendering was achieved using a prototype developed in previous research. And this takes a virtual speaker approach using vector-based amplitude panning as the spatialization technique. VBAP represents every spatial location using a direct product of the output of the nearest three adjacent speakers. And one advantage of this approach was that it was possible to develop a stimulus trajectory that focused the user's attention on mostly the positions of those virtual speakers. Using two components to the stimulus, firstly, a continuous orbit of around two seconds that occurred evenly around the horizontal plane, so encompassing five of the virtual speakers, and then five short blasts occurring at the remaining four speaker positions in the sequence numbered on this diagram on the right hand side. And we wanted to use a kind of real world stimulus that was appropriate for an end user use case. So we developed that from anechoic recording of trumpet taken from the source referenced below on the right hand side. Here is how that stimulus sounds. That's obviously the unfiltered version of the stimulus, so with no spatial effect applied. So that material was used for part one of the research, which was the HRTF selection component. So 21 participants were recruited for the study and each participant repeated the selection process on three occasions. And this was to establish the repeatability or reliability of the selection process. Each session was conducted at least 48 hours apart. And on each occasion, users were making direct comparisons between the short list of seven HRTFs optimised from the Listen database. That involved 21 comparisons in all for each session to compare all combinations of seven HRTF. And the judgment that the participants were asked to make was which has the more convincing 3D effect, X or A or B. So on each repetition of the session, part one was immediately followed by part two, which was a follow-up localization task. The data from this part of the study only involves 20 participants uh, for reasons given in the paper. 
And each of the three repeat sessions involved 40 localization targets, 20 using the HRTF set that was rated best and 20 using the set that was rated worst by the user. And because of known limitations in the rendering system, the system was divided into three different strata and seven different azimuth locations were presented randomly across those three different strata other than zero degrees, which was not used on the horizontal plane. And on this occasion, the judgment that users were asked to make was where is the target sound source? And they used their physical orientation and a simple input interface to identify the location of the target sound, which sounded like this. So briefly, we'll talk about some highlights from the outcomes. In terms of HRTF selection reliability, we applied a statistical technique called intra-class correlation to evaluate the reliability of each participant's ratings across their three repeated sessions. So the outcomes are in this table, and it just so happens by chance that they divided evenly into three groups. So a third showed agreement that was either fair or good between their three rating sessions. Another third showed very weak levels agreement, so agreeing beyond chance level, but not to a degree that would be considered reliable. Then a third were actually systematically disagreeing with themselves between the three sessions. It's worth also noting that there are a mixture of different participant profiles across groups in terms of prior exposure to binaural audio. In terms of localization accuracy, we set thresholds of plus minus 15 degrees for azimuth and plus minus 22.5 degrees for elevation, the rationale for which is outlined in the paper. Generally, levels of accuracy in the lower stratum, so at minus 45 degrees elevation, were particularly poor. More details of that in the paper. But there was an apparent benefit to azimuth accuracy outside of that lower stratum, and that was to a significant degree over the horizontal plane. But another aspect that we looked at was changes in accuracy over time, which showed that there was a significant improvement in elevation accuracy for the upper stratum in the second half of people's sessions, and that was irrespective of whether they were using their best or worst HRTF set, which was actually randomized. At the same time, that improvement in elevation localization was accompanied by improved response speed and at no expense to horizontal accuracy. And the improvement in response time was also true of the middle stratum, so zero degrees elevation. So some final words in uh, discussion and conclusion. We'll return to the criteria that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. So in terms of reliability, as I've said, a third of participants were showing a fair or good level of consistency in their selections. This in itself is not what you could call reliable, but it shows an encouraging trend and capability for the system. In terms of validity, there's some evidence of benefit to horizontal localization that supports the case for further investigation. We found no evidence to suggest that the approach favours more experienced listeners than less experienced listeners. And there were some participants who were wholly new to binaural listening that were capable of achieving fair or good levels of reliability. And finally, we think that a completion time of 12 to 13 minutes is getting close to the kind of length you'd want for an end user consumer oriented selection procedure. So just to conclude, we developed a study that looked at potential approach for binaural personalization in auditory mixed reality contexts. It focused specifically on the practicalities of achieving this with non-specialist end users. And there are some encouraging findings on which to base further investigations. And of course, I'm happy to answer or discuss any questions or comments that people might have in response. Thank you.